Okay, so this is lesson 1-1, which is key features of functions. Our essential question for this lesson is how do graphs and equations reveal information about a relationship between two quantities? So the first example gets into domain and range. We're going to talk about two different ways we can write domain and range. Um, and the first question asks is what are the domain and range of the function defined by y equals x squared minus 3? So it's great if right now you know what that graph is going to look like, but if you don't, you will by the end of the year be able to just look at shifts and changes to equations and have a picture in your mind of what that quadratic or polynomial graph is going to look like. Um, right now, though, it's totally fine to plug it into some sort of graphing calculator or Desmos. So you can go to www, I'll write that up here, dot Desmos dot com. Or you can find the free Desmos app and you can graph that equation right there and you'll see the quadratic that we see on the right. So it's okay to graph stuff so you can see what it looks like. So this whole first lesson is about key features of graphs. So not actually making the graphs, but being able to read them. Okay. So we have our picture over here and it says the domain and range. So I want to remind you, I know you have done domain and range before. So domain is all set of your inputs, which when we're talking about a graph, it's your X values. Okay. So x values, so it's saying what numbers can I put into this equation and have it work? Or if we're looking at the graph, what x's is it going to reach? So from this graph over here, you can tell that these arrows show that it's going to keep getting wider and wider as the further the graph or the further we zoom out of the graph, it's going to get wider and wider and wider. And so that means that it's going to eventually reach all the positive x's and all the negative x's. So our domain is all real numbers for this graph. So set builder notation looks like this. So we say the x because that's our variable we use for domain. And then we can say x is a real number. Okay, the other thing you can do is you can say this symbol right here, which is the real number symbol. So the domain is, is x is a real number, or we can say, we can just use that r symbol right there for real numbers. So this is set builder notation, okay? And then the other notation that we're going to talk about is interval notation. You're gonna use interval notation. I use interval notation way more than set builder, but it's important to understand there are multiple ways of representing this. So interval notation is just listing the lowest and highest interval that x can be. So interval notation for your domain would be negative infinity to positive infinity. And so what we need to understand is that we use curved brackets or parentheses when it can't be the number, and we use square brackets when it can be. So we use always are going to use curved brackets with infinity and negative infinity because we can't reach infinity. It's not a number. So this tells us that x can be any number all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, so that's domain. Now we're going to talk about range. So range is all sets of our outputs or our y values. So when you're looking at the graph now, you're thinking about up and down. So does the graph go up forever? Again, our arrows are going to, they're both pointing up. So yes, it's going to hit all of our positive y values. But is it going to go down forever? And the answer would be no, because we see we have this right here, which is the vertex of the quadratic, which we'll talk about um, a little bit in future lessons. It's also referred to in this particular graph as the minimum. So because we have a minimum, that means that there's a low number that it can't go below. So in this case, it's negative 3. Our graph cannot go below negative 3. So if we're writing this in set builder notation, this time it's y because we're talking about the range. 
and we're going to write the to the right part since it's not just any number we're going to write it as an interval so we're going to say or sorry not interval uh inequality so y is greater than or equal to negative three so that is our set builder notation our interval notation we talk we always write it from our lowest value to our highest value so our lowest value on this graph is negative three so and it can be negative three so the minimum is located at negative three so we're going to use a square bracket negative three and then it goes to infinity because those arrows point up forever so we write infinity with a curved bracket so these are, this is set builder notation and interval notation for both domain and range of this graph. Okay, so our second example, or third example, we're kind of skipping some examples, so is to identify positive and negative intervals. So when we're talking about intervals, we are going to just describe the x values. So positive and negative means we're, we're, we're thinking about the y values. Is it a positive? Is the graph positive or negative? But when we write it, we're just writing the x values. Okay? So I'm going to, let's, we think green usually represents positive and red usually represents negative. So we'll do that on our graph. So if I'm following along my parabola here, so this is x squared minus 9. Again, you can type it into Desmos or into a graphing calculator to see what it's going to look like. So positive and negative values. So positive is right here. So my graph is positive here and here. So those two parts of my graph are positive. And then I'm going to use red to show negative. And this part in here is where it's negative. So where it's dipping down below the x-axis, that's my negative part. When it's above, that's my positive part. Okay, so let's go back to normal here. Okay, so for what intervals is it positive? Oops. Okay, so positive intervals. So what we have to understand is that at when it's hitting the x-axis, it's technically neither positive nor negative. So that means that our intercepts, our x-intercepts, are not going to be included. So we're going to use curved brackets for our x values when we're talking about here. Because so positive, we're thinking if we go along the x-axis, right here it's positive, And then it changes right here. So we're going to start in negative infinity. And we reach a problem number at negative 3. So at negative 3, it stops being positive. And I used a curved bracket because it's neither positive nor negative at negative 3. So it doesn't include the negative 3. Okay, then as we're going along, here my graph is negative. So I'm not going to list any of these numbers. And then at 3, it starts being positive again. So we would say 3 to infinity is positive. So these two intervals, and this is interval notation again, are where my graph is positive. Negative is just going to be the interval that's in between those two values. So the red part of my graph, so we would write that as negative three. Oops. So that's the positive intervals and the negative intervals. Okay, and then you might also be asked, so I'm kind of including a couple other examples in this one, you might also be asked to find um, intervals of, of increasing and decreasing. So let's start with decreasing. So just like with um, positive and negative, you're still going to be writing the x values when we're talking about decreasing and increasing. So decreasing is just where is my graph going down. So if we start at negative infinity, it's decreasing. You can see here it's decreasing, decreasing, decreasing all the way till I get to this point right here. So again, we're reading x values. So the x value at the minimum of my function is 0. So it's decreasing from negative infinity to 0. 
and then it's increasing from zero to infinity. So this part right here is increasing and it's going to keep increasing, we know, because it's a parabola. Okay, so that talks about naming intervals. We've talked again, the vertex or the lowest point of our graph is the minimum where the graph crosses the x-axis. We can call those x-intercepts. We can also call them zeros, okay? So that is intervals of positive, negative, increasing, and decreasing. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about with this lesson is the average rate of change. So the average rate of change, um, there is a formula that you can write down. So if we're trying to find the average rate of change between point A and point B on this little graph over here, it would be F of B minus F of A over B minus A. So you can memorize that if you want. You don't really have to. So basically, average rate of change is a fancy way of asking what is the slope between those two points. So especially if you have a graph, you can just find, okay, how much did we rise over how much did we run? Okay, so it's just the slope. It's all right here, slope. Okay, so average rate of change is just the slope between two points. So the thing with average rate of change though is you're not gonna be finding necessarily the average rate of change on a, on a line all the time. Like this example over here is not a linear function. So you're imagining that there's a straight line between the two points and that's what the average rate of change is. You're ignoring the fact that the graph is curved. Okay? Okay, so this example says, what do the average rate of change of the function y equals absolute value of x plus 2 over the following intervals indicate about the function? Okay, so again... At this point, I don't expect that you, in your mind, know what this graph looks like. So it's okay to graph it in Desmos. Um, but so absolute value, we'll sketch. Okay, so there's my absolute value graph. So again, I could plug these into formulas or I could just find these location, these points located on my graph, which is gonna make my life easier. So negative over the interval negative two to zero. So at negative two, we're right here. Zero, we're right here. So we can see the slope. So the slope between, so again, these are all x values that are listed here. So negative 2 is x, 0 is an x. So this is my point at negative 2. So it's the point negative 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then 0, 2. So that's, those are my first two points that I'm looking at. So the average rate of change between those, you can see the slope is going down 1 over 1. So the average rate of change is negative 1. The average rate of change between 0 and 3, so we already have our 0 point right here, and then at 1, 2, 3, I'm going to erase a little bit here. My graph was not perfect, so, okay. That's better. Okay, so at 3 right here, the point 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2. Okay, so the, we can see that we're going up, up 3 over 3. So that means it's a slope of positive 1, or up, we can say up 3 over 3, which equals 1. Okay, and last we have negative 2 to 3. So that means we're going to focus on that starting point and the ending point and find the slope. So between those two points, it looks like we're going up one. So we're basically doing that slope right there. So up one over five. So what does that indicate about this function? So what, it's, what it wants you to think of from this is the fact that since we have different slopes between all of these points, this is not linear. 
So if you had done all of those average rates of change and found that they were all the same number, that would mean that simplified, if you simplified all of the average rate, average rates of change and they were all the same, that would mean you'd have a linear function. But since they're all three different numbers, it means it's not linear and we already know that because it's absolute value. Okay, so that is lesson 1-1. Let me know if you have any questions.